Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out on a Friday evening. We really very much appreciate it, and you are in for a treat. This is um, one of our final uh, events for the Sega National Colloquium of this year, where we've been returning alumni to campus to share their stories, their passions, um, their careers with you guys in the hopes, especially to, with the students here at Ohio Wesleyan, in the hopes that you can find inspiration, uh, find a bit of comfort, and hopefully make some connections, not only to some alumni here at OWU, but also um, to your own interests and your own passions. And so uh, today I am delighted to welcome four of our journalism alumni um, who have all forged paths in journalism, communications, and related fields. And they're here to share their experiences uh, at OWU, their experiences as they began to find their career paths, the um, ways that journalism has changed on them <laughs> over the course of their careers, and to kind of reflect about the, the nature of what this field that matters to them is, the, the nature of that field in their, their lives. We are actually thrilled to have on the stage with our four journalists who will briefly who will shortly introduce themselves we're um, thrilled to have one of our own students Aaron Ross who is a junior communications and journalism double major an English minor and a student athlete uh, she runs track and field and she is graciously volunteered to um, be the person um, asking our distinguished alumni the questions that will hopefully spur a really dynamic conversation and want to remind you all that there are three more Sagan events to round out the semester on next Tuesday Martha Parks an English creative writing alumna who works with um, graphic essays is going to be in the Bailey room at 4 p.m. Um, doing a reading and a showing of some of her work. And then on next Thursday, Cameron Hewitt, travel writer who works with the Rick Steves um, travel organization is gonna be on campus talking about his path from OWU to the world. And then finally, the grand finale of the Sega National Colloquium will be November 19th when Ohio Wesleyan English and creative writing alum Joshua Mandelbaum talks about the nonprofit he has created that lets children become superheroes and try to change the world through writing. So thank you all for being here. Look forward to seeing you at more events. And without further ado, Erin. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Like she said, without further ado, um, I'm just gonna dive right in and ask everyone if they could tell us a little bit more about themselves, the most recent job you've had, and why was it important to you? Do you all have to go first? I think so. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, I'm gonna see which mic to go to. Hi, everybody, thanks so much for coming. Um, my name is Donna Gallo. I graduated from Ohio Wesleyan in 1993, so quite a little ways ago. Um, I loved being here. I think I would start out by saying um, that coming to Ohio Wesleyan was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me, one of the greatest privileges um, in a what has been a, a great life. So um, for those of you who are students here, um, you're super lucky and I'm a little jealous of you um, that you're still here and learning. So this is a special place. Um, I was very active on campus when I was here, Delta Gamma, um, Panhellenic president, um, a bunch of other things. I sort of maxed it out. So. Um, I was a journalism major. Um, there were a number of us at the time. I can't say too much about it because my professor is sitting here glaring at me from the second row. <laughs> um, it was a great major at the time. I think that it makes sense that it has been expanded to more of a communications um, scenario because that definitely is where, um, certainly where opportunity will be and communicating is a skill that will carry you through many jobs. Um, I would say the job that I would talk about was, um, I had a very unique story um, leaving Ohio Wesleyan. I had been an intern at Family Circle Magazine 
um, and they hired me in March of my senior year. And so I went there um, three weeks after graduation and I stayed for 26 years, um, which is very unusual. So I started out reading their reader mail um, and doing a, you know lunch orders and other assorted um, tasks. And when I exited publishing last September, I was the deputy editor um, of, the, of the magazine. Which was, um, which was great. So I would say the job was important to me because one, it was you know, the only, really the only job that I had um, having moved up through the, the ranks and kind of knowing, you know, knowing how a magazine was produced and then getting to be one of the producers um, as opposed to kind of one of the um, you know, observers at the lower level and safeguarding the brand um, you know, through, through many, many iterations and many changes. Um, and the last couple of years that I was at Family Circle, I would often liken it to being on a bridge, running across a bridge that was on fire behind you. <laughs> um, publishing was tough times in publishing. So I'm glad that I got to be there when I did. Um, I was very proud to work at Family Circle. It was really important part of women's lives. Um, and I knew that from reading, you know, reading all the letters that they sent us. Um, and they, you know, they used our skin cancer checks and they used our recipes and it gave them you know, as I sort of went through the life stages of Family Circle and had a family of my own and, you know, and had kids of my own. I have two kids. My son is 15. My daughter's 11. Um, so helping women, you know, run their families and meld together all the, all the parts of their lives was very meaningful to me because I was trying to do it and I was doing it um, in real time. So that was, uh, was a pretty cool experience. Um, I think when you know history writes the books on women's magazines, most of which are gone at this point. Family Circle went out of business a month ago, um, which was you know heartbreaking to those of us that were there, even though we certainly saw it coming. Um, you know, I think when history writes the books on women's magazines and what were known as the Seven Sisters in the 90s, um, they were really important and they meant a lot to women. And I was very lucky to get to be there for you know for a quarter century of that. So, and I got that because of what I learned here. So I guess that's what I'll say to start. Hey there, I'm uh, Tom Jolly, uh, class of 1977, um, along with Gordon Witkin. Uh, you guys can do the math on how long ago that was. I'm, I'm in journalism, so that's, that's why I, I don't do the math. Uh, <laughs> <Agreed>. <laughs> Um, I'm, uh, I'm at the New York Times. I guess 26 years is a, is a magic number here. That's how long I've been at the Times. Um, I, uh, I, I didn't expect to be at the New York Times when I left Ohio Wesleyan, and I didn't expect to be at the New York Times for 26 years after I got to the New York Times. But um, it's been a great experience. Um, uh, I, I guess my, uh, um, the last 26 years have been my most recent job, but, but, <laughs> but uh, looked at another way, what I'm doing in the last several years is um, I'm responsible for the newspaper product, the, you know, the actual printed uh, newspaper. We now have a, a several divisions newspaper, digital, uh, video. Uh, we have a television program. We have a, a, a podcast that's, that's very successful. And um, so I'm, I'm uh, uh, grateful to have the opportunity to sort of try to um, maintain print as a going product and, and try to uh, energize it in a lot of ways. We've come up with a lot of different things like stand, uh, special sections that we've uh, started to produce on a pretty regular basis that uh, display some of our great work that's also online. Um, and, you know, without trying to be melodramatic, I also feel like uh, in the environment we're in, um, trying to maintain uh, journalism and un an understanding of the uh, importance of the First Amendment and the free press uh, is, uh, is an important part of, uh, of our everyday life uh, at the Times. Hi, everyone. I'm Kara Ackrey, class of 1995. Um, I played varsity field hockey and lacrosse while I was here, and I managed the women's basketball team. Um, so I had four different jobs, work-study jobs, <laughs> while I was here as well, and kind of uh, pulled my career together here at Ohio Wesleyan on a shoestring. Um, journalism was the passion and the major that I wanted to do when I got here. Um, I minored in po uh, politics and government as well. Um, so those two things um, set the foundation for my career. Um, I started off after graduation. My very first job was a stringer for the Associated Press. Um, and then I was hired full time by a small community newspaper in Columbus um, and worked my way up to work as part of the State House Press Corps. 
Um, and then unfortunately uh, got caught up in kind of the downfall of community newspapers um, and newspapers altogether uh, and left because um, being a reporter, um, didn't keep a roof over my head, didn't make the car payment, didn't pay for my kids. Um, and so I transitioned into public relations where I have been in the environmental industry now for well over 20 years. Um, and I work in corporate communications in the environmental contracting universe. I do everything from transacting brownfield properties, um, selling uh, dilapidated real estate, buying dilapidated real estate. Um, I do lobbying. Um, I do corporate communications. I do emergency and crisis response. I work in incident command centers. Um, and I'm a spokesperson overall for our company. So uh, pretty kind of a drastic change from you know just being a journalism major. Um, but transitioning into the corporate universe provided me with what I needed to be able to raise my family. Um, surprisingly, the way life goes, my daughter is a sophomore at the University of Cincinnati. And uh, she's a double major in journalism and political science. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Gordon Whitkin. I'm also the class of 77. So Tom and I have known each other since 19, the fall of 1973. Uh, I can't do the math on that either. Um, I was originally from the New York area. I was Greek here. I was a member of the Phi Delta Theta House. Uh, we're going to bring that back, by the way. Um, <laughs> and um, I played two years of soccer, and I was on the, uh, in the jazz band. I was involved in the uh, transcript uh, heavily as well. Um, deeply wanted to be a journalist. I was a double major of journalism and politics and government. Uh, when I left here, after sending out uh, 200 resumes from Maine to California and living in my parents' basement, thinking the world was ending for six months, I got a job as the night police reporter at the Indianapolis Star. Uh, I was at the Indianapolis Star three and a half years in total. And then uh, in, in uh, following along with the theme here, I spent 26 years at, <laughs> at U.S. News and World Report magazine. Um, which uh, back when it was actually a weekly news magazine, I started in a bureau in Detroit, was there for a year, then I was the bureau chief in Denver for five years, then was transferred to Washington where the magazine was headquartered, served 11 years as the um, main criminal justice writer, four years as the chief of correspondence, and my last five years uh, I was the national affairs editor. And loved that job, uh, U.S. News and World Report, uh, for those of you who are a certain age, it was the more sort of sober, serious, uh, drier, some would say boring uh, <laughs> news magazine, but I loved it, um, really loved it, because I loved the weekly genre, I loved the way it was put together, the ability to have time to write, report, have great photos, graphics, have it all come together, but in a weekly genre, you were still in the news environment, um, but similar to my magazine colleague here, it became clear in the early 2000s that the internet uh, was eroding and then destroying the idea that people would get their news once a week from a magazine. So US News as an actual journalistic institution began to crumble and I looked in the mirror and said, well, it's been a good run, but one way or another, this is ending, I have to get out. So I left, spent a very unhappy year at Congressional Quarterly, and then for the last 11 years until this summer, uh, when I semi-retired, I was either managing editor or executive editor of a not-for-profit uh, uh, investigative news organization that does long-form investigative reporting on the web. Uh, and we have uh, the very officious name of the Center for Public Integrity. Uh, my, my longtime friends like Tom, when I got the job, said, gee, Gordon, I've never really associated you with integrity. Are you sure this is the right job for you? Um, but it was, a, it was a great job. It was uh, very serious, long form investigative reporting. So it was um, uh, very challenging, but also uh, very gratifying to be able to have time in this uh, 
everything has to be done in five seconds environment to do long form investigative reporting. We, d we didn't have to do any entertainment, no sports, never did anything about the Kardashians. Um, and we would, we were generally, our reporting was trusted, so mainstream organizations that had way more eyeballs than we did uh, would reprint our material, which gave us much more reach. The Times would occasionally use our stuff, the Washington Post, USA Today, NPR, Daily Beast, uh, The Atlantic, uh, a number of other publications like that. Um, so I guess we are all examples of having to cope with a world uh, that's been changing journalistically, but uh, have mostly landed on our feet by being able to be uh, nimble and flexible. Each of you touched a little bit on your experiences at OWU, but what stands out to you the most about your time at the university, and how did it prepare you for your career? I'm not going first. All right, I'll go, I'll go first. <laughs> um, Ohio Wesleyan has had the benefit for the last couple decades, I think, of a terrific journalism professor, Paul Costew, who sits in the second row here. Before Paul arrived, uh, Tom and I had the benefit of someone I felt was the greatest college professor ever, who ever lived, a guy named Vern Edwards, who was pretty much a one-man uh, journalism department, but pushed us uh, extremely hard, uh, was, I would say, the epitome of tough love, uh, someone who brokered no laziness, no mistakes, uh, but if you did the work, uh, he would help you get started on his career, and he helped a whole generation of Ohio Wesleyan kids get started on their careers. Um, the journalism group that was here in the mid-70s, many of us, Tom and I both included, who worked on the transcript, included people who became the managing editor of the Indianapolis Star, the managing editor of the Detroit Free Press, the managing editor of uh, Rolling Stone, um, an assistant managing editor of the New York Times, two of us who became assistant managing editors at U.S. News and World Report, uh, the VP of Communications for the Cleveland Indians, um, and the European editor of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so it was really an amazing crew, uh, and we all cut our teeth uh, at the transcript. Um, the other thing couple things that meant a lot to me at Ohio Wesleyan was the ability to uh, have a second major. I had some great professors in politics and government, and I think if you're going to go into the media, I uh, would deeply encourage you to uh, have a second, more academic major. Uh, if you're going to be in this field, it's essential that you know something about history, about politics and government, uh, and so forth. And um, I, I think the, my memory is just that the school had wonderful professors who both pushed you and, and really uh, cared about you and that the beauty of a small liberal arts school focused on undergraduate education is that you take your classes from professors, not teaching assistants. I'll go next. Um, I think I owe my career and everything that I've learned and been able to accomplish to Paul. Um, he was uh, kind of my rock when I got here to Ohio Wesleyan. I was a non-traditional student. I don't know if you all still call folks here in Delaware townies. I was a townie. Um, <laughs> I lived in an apartment underground, illegally off campus. Uh, my dad was dean of engineering at Ohio State University. And the reason I wound up at Ohio Wesleyan was because I had a bad, very bad intro interview with um, the chair of the Department of Journalism at Ohio State, where he had his feet up on his credenza and his back to me during the entire discussion. I don't even think he looked me once in the eye. And I was very angry and upset after that interview. And I got the car, my little 1982 Mazda GLC, and I drove up 315 just to, you know, burn it off, to, to burn off the anger. And I, uh, wound up on Route 23, not really sure where I was going, pre-GPS folks, um, and drove straight into the center of town and saw signs for Ohio Wesleyan and saw the admissions office in the parking lot, pulled in, got out of the car, walked to the admissions office, got an application, walked over to the Wendy's, got a Junior Bacon Cheeseburger, filled out the application, 
Walked back and turned it in. Three weeks later, got a notice that I was accepted to Ohio Wesleyan, waved it in my dad's face and said, I'm going to Owu. And my dad and I have a great relationship now, just so everybody knows, but he was not very happy with me at the time. Um, and he told me at that point, you're on your own, so he wouldn't pay for tuition. Um, so I had to scrape together a lot of money to be able to get here and to be able to afford this experience. Um, I checked all my books out from Beagley Library because <laughs> I couldn't afford to buy them in the bookstore. Um, so I would get syllabuses from professors um, before the start of the semester so I knew what books we needed. Um, Paul loaned me a ton of our journalism books from his own collection on his bookshelf in the office. Um, and, and he helped me when I came to him at the beginning of my junior year and told him I was out of money. He helped me figure out how to get the rest of my classes done so that I could graduate early um, and move off and get on to my career. And that changed my life. Um, along with, I think, a turning point for me was the media law class. Um, there were so many valuable things that I took away from that specific class. Um, everything from learning how to read upside down. I spent a lot of my time turning papers over and reading them upside down because when you're sitting across the desk, even now in the corporate world, I sit across from our CEO and I peruse his desk and I read things upside down all the time and I learn a lot about what's going on because I can read upside down and I can read upside down because of Paul. Um, being able to go and, um, and, and pull documents that I need now for contract negotiations, um, those were all things that I learned here when he pushed and pushed and pushed us to go gather all these documents from the courthouse and the recorder's office, you know, following election night results. Um, there's just so many valuable tools that I learned that now apply to what I do every day in corporate America. I read contracts to the letter because of what I learned in the media law class. Um, and, and I think, you know, those are the things that um, you may not know it right now. You may not recognize those things that you're learning here and the experiences that you're taking away right now. But I promise you, 25 years down the road when you're sitting here and you come back to campus on a day like today and you drive around and you see where you used to live and you see where you used to go to class and you see people that you remember, um, it will come rushing back to you and you'll appreciate everything that you learned here and what it means to you and what it's meant to you in helping you build the foundation and stepping stones of your career. Well, I, I will say first that I made a pretty concerted effort to carve out a professional Frisbee golf career here. Um, <laughs> the fourth hole was the front door of Beagley. But it became apparent that that wasn't going to work uh, professionally. And, um, and in all seriousness, uh, as Gordon said, Vern uh, Edwards was a, uh, a force of nature for uh, those of us in the journalism program. Uh, on, on several occasions, Vern uh, uh, sort of uh, righted the ship for me. Um, uh, on one occasion, uh, I think it was in my, uh, I guess it was the beginning of my senior year, he, and this was in the pre-cell phone era, not only pre-GPS, <laughs> uh, um, uh, he called my parents at home. Uh, I was living off campus and, uh, and I, I guess he, he obviously did not have the phone number for our, our off-campus house. And he said, uh, I've been trying to get in touch with Tom. I've got a job that, that he might be interested in doing. Uh, get, him, get him to get in touch with me. So of course my parents called me and said, what the heck are you doing? Why aren't you, you, know, why aren't you talking to your journalism professor about a job? So it turned out to be a part-time PR thing and it gave me a little experience working uh, in that world uh, and, uh, and, and was a great little kind of taste of that world for me and also provided some cash for post Frisbee golf. Um, uh, and then, be, uh, as it turned out, when I, when I graduated from, from uh, Ohio Wesleyan, I was also, as Gordon said, one of, one of the sort of precepts of, of Vern's program was that there were very few journalism classes that you actually took. He, his his uh, approach was he wanted you to have a, a broad uh, base knowledge in all kinds of different subjects. And, um, and, and one of the subjects that I was very interested in was politics. I ended up getting an internship with a state senator in Columbus my uh, final semester here. And that turned into a job with him. He, he was running for mayor of Cleveland uh, in an election that Dennis Kucinich ultimately won uh, in, in 1978, I guess it was. And, um, and, I, and so I worked, I, I worked in politics for a couple of years right out of school and kind of dabbled in uh, in that world in, in, in several different, in, both in Cleveland and Columbus, uh, including working for the guy who had run for mayor 
uh, in his uh, state senate office in Columbus as his legislative assistant. Um, I, I, I was wrestling as I got out of college with, did I, in my head it was like, did I wanna cover what was happening as a journalist or did I wanna be a part of changing the world as a person in politics? And um, whether it was the politicians I was working with or whether this is just a cynical view of, the, of politics, I felt like I was spending more time promoting those politicians than actually doing anything that was making any kind of substa substantial uh, uh, change in the world. So I called Vern up and I said, hey, I'm having second thoughts about this politics stuff. And Vern lined up an interview for me with the editor of the Delaware Gazette, Red Reed. And thankfully, Vern's word was gold and Red gave me a job. And uh, I worked here in Delaware as a reporter for the Gazette for two years. Uh, and that led to other jobs uh, uh, in Annapolis, Pittsburgh, and ultimately New York. Uh, so um, on at least two occasions for sure, my career would not be where it is were, were it not for, for Vern, um, but in many other ways, including uh, uh, you know, professors like Libby Reed, uh, who was the, uh, uh, an English professor here, uh, Dave Smith, who was a history professor here, and, and any number of other people have uh, continued to have influence on, on me and just in the way they uh, taught me to think, uh, challenged me uh, about certain things, and, uh, and more than anything, encouraged me. I have many thoughts having listened to my colleagues up here. Um, the first being about just the sort of the spirit of this place when you come back on campus. Um, I brought my 11-year-old daughter with me here today who had never been to Ohio Wesleyan before and walking her around today um, has been one of the greatest days of my adult life, I would say, just sort of reflecting and showing her all the Slocum 220 where I took Paul Costi's class. Um, so to keep it back to the Ohio Wesleyan connection, so there was, I missed Vern Edwards by a year, um, which feels sadder and sadder to me when I hear stories like this, but he had just retired. Um, Paul had just come in. And literally, I owed a 26-year career to Paul, who was in the department at the time, and an adjunct professor named Sarah Snyder, who was here. Um, and she had, she was an interesting person. She had been a reporter. She covered something to do with a big FEMA site, I think, was, uh, you know, was her journalistic um, side. And so she knew that I wanted to work in magazines, because I always wanted to work in magazines, going back to, you know, Cricket and Penny Power and then 17 and YM and, and all of them and it's just like the golden age of print and I was a print person um, and she knew I wanted to work in magazines and so my junior year she handed me this paper flyer um, and said you should do this and I looked at it and said okay what's this and it was an application to a summer internship program sponsored by the American Society of Magazine Editors which is known as ASME. Um, and so they run a program that they actually still run, um, which I think is interesting, but they, they do a lot more digital. But anyway, ASME was, uh, it's a very, um, you know, prestigious program. Um, you know, it, it's by competitive application. Um, and she said, you know, you should do this. And I was kind of like, I, I don't know, you know, like, and it was a lot of work. It looked like work, um, it smelled like work. It felt like work. Um, and as Paul Costu told me a number of times during my career, like, you need to get serious about this. Um, it's not all fun and games. And so Sarah and Paul got, you know, helped me get my application together. They wrote my, you know, professor recommendations. And so I got that job and I interned at Family Circle um, in the summer of 92. And, in, you know, I sort of stayed in touch with them over the course of my senior year. And in March of my senior year here, I got a call was living, you know, in the dorm. It was a curly-haired, you know, curly, uh, you know, cord phone. That's what we were still using. And it was the editor of Family Circle at the time. And she said, what are you doing after graduation? And I said, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I guess, figuring that out. And she said, why don't you come work for me? Um, we, you know, we could use you back. And I said, like, what would I be doing? And she said, I'm not sure yet, actually. But we'll, we'll you, you know, just come back. Um, so I started to work there June 1st um, after I graduated, and that turned into, um, you know, 20, 26 years. At, like I said, it, it, was, it was tough at the end on a number of levels, but um, 
it still was, uh, was an incredible experience and an incredible thing to be part of. And, and I think as time goes on, when people look back at magazines, I will be even, I was proud to be there at the time. For me as a New Yorker, it was like playing for the Yankees. Um, and I loved it. And um, I think as, as time goes on, and people will see sort of the, the importance that those magazines played. They were really part of the American culture, um, and it's terrible that they're mostly gone. Um, but so I got my literal job, first job, which became my 26-year job um, as a result of my professors. I mean, I had never heard of the ASME program, and if they hadn't told me about it, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known about it. I wouldn't have done it, and then, I mean, presumably I would have done something, <laughs> you know, but, um, but I certainly wouldn't have done that um, on my own. So. And then what I'll say about after that is that I think here um, I really got a, a deep rooted appreciation just for the value of education, um, of intellectual curiosity, of um, you know, wanting to learn about you know, all different things. Um, you know, I was the first in my family to go to college. My mother was a bank teller for 35 years. My father was a small business owner. Um, you know, we certainly had a, a nice life, um, but college was, uh, was a tremendous opportunity and a game changer, um, I think, for me. And the learning about education piece that reflects back is that, so after I exited publishing in uh, September of 2017, uh, 2018, 18, um, I, you know, first of all, you know, like Paul and I had lots of conversations, you know, back and forth about that. Nancy Bill Rakowski, who was, you know, was an advisor and very trusted friend to me when I was here and is still an advisor and trusted friend to me. We had lunch with our daughters here on campus today, which was remarkably special. Um, you know, I did a lot of soul searching and I, I did a lot of consulting over that year, trying out sort of different things that, you know, I worked in everything from, you know, doing executive bios for venture capital. Um, to, you know, I, I actually still sort of do a good business um, doing, of all things, English copywriting for uh, an Italian company that's owned by a friend of my sister's. Um, their English copy was their Italian copy run through Google Translate, and it was terrible. Um, and so I write all of their English copy now, um, which is fun and fairly lucrative um, and just was an interesting thing to do, um, you know, during, during that year of sort of trying to do all different things. But what happened on the back end of that year was that I found out that um, I didn't like being in my house all the time. Um, you know, I was a, a people person and a team person. I worked, you know, in, in a women's magazine with primarily women, um, and there were, so it was like a work family, you know, type of thing, and it turned out that I missed that. Um, so I kind of tried to put it all together with the help of a career coach, and I figured that what I really wanted to try to do somehow is get into something having to do with education, um, because I, I believe in education, in sort of in all forms. I think we all could use more of it. I think it's sort of the secret to everything. Maybe it'll be what saves us. I, I don't know, I hope. Um, but so I now am the director of communications at a K through eight charter school um, in New York City, which is, um, has been a crazy interesting experience. Um, I'm so glad they took a chance on me. Um, it was a, a role that they created for me. Um, through a, I got to meet the principal through a friend, not from Ohio Wesleyan, most of my friends are from Ohio Wesleyan, but she's actually the, the mother of a kid that I went to school with and I've known since I was five. His mother, Maureen, is the director of instruction at this school and I reached out to her and said, you know, I'd love to hear more about your school. I'm trying to find out about schools and how I might get into that you know, environment somehow. And, and she said, like, well, you don't have any experience. You're not a teacher. And I said, well, right, but I would like to, I, I'd like to do it anyway. Um, and so, sort of long story longer, she introduced me to the principal of the school, um, and you know, we met a number of times. I think the first one was, in it, was what I would call an interview. They asked me you know, strengths and weaknesses and accomplishments and all of that. And the second, three, or the third, second, third, and fourth meetings were really more, I don't even know what they were. Like, we were just kind of hanging out, like talking about things. And I eventually said to him, you know, like, I'm just curious, like, are, what, are, like, are we going to do something with this? Or like, because I have other, you know, other things that I'm pursuing. I need to figure out something. It's going to be a year in September, and I, I want to sort of get on some type of path. And he said, you know, I don't really know what you're going to do, but I have this feeling that if I don't hire you, I am going to regret it. So welcome to the team, um, and which is like a crazy thing. And so now I am the director of communications at a charter school um, in the Bronx, which is... 19 minutes from my front door, which I cite as a very key driver because 
Prior to that, I was commuting four hours a day in and out of Manhattan, and it was soul crushing. And I <laughs> felt, I mean, it was terrible. And I, I mean, it was terrible. And I thought to myself, I worked, you know, with a career coach, uh, you know, during my, my sort of year of exploration. And, you know, the lucky thing about having left Family Circle after 26 years was that I did get a generous package to leave. And so I had turnaround time which was really, um, it was really a gift. And so that definitely is also, you know, kind of part of the story. Um, and so working with her, I sort of zeroed in on the education piece and how I wanted to sort of put that together. But I also said to her, I, I don't want to commute four hours a day anymore. It, that's time that comes from my kids and it's time that comes from myself. Like, you know, I feel like if I had four extra hours a day, like I could Maybe, you know, I could spend more time with my kids for sure. I maybe could exercise, like, you know, and that it turns out that that was correct. Those four hours, um, you know, have mostly gone back to my kids. Um, I, I took up running, of all things. I'm still the world's slowest runner, but in the time between that that happened, I lost 75 pounds um, because I could sort of exercise and I wasn't so stressed out about work all the time. So it's been, uh, it's been great. So I'll leave it at that. What is the biggest obstacle you faced in uh, shaping your career, and what did you learn from the experience? Go. I, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so, like I mentioned earlier, I've been in the environmental industry for over 20 years now, um, and particularly on the contracting um, side of that industry, so those are the yellow iron, the guys that dig dirt, shovels in the ground side of the business. Um, and the environmental industry is traditionally a male-dominated industry. Um, so, uh, you know, being a woman, um, being a woman who is a journalism major in a science and engineering based, primarily based um, industry means that you have to work sometimes four or five times as hard as your male counterparts um, to prove your knowledge, to prove your worth, um, to claw your way to the top. And so that's been a lot of blood, sweat, tears, um, and proving, co continuously proving my value um, to the organizations that I've worked for, to, to the clients that I've worked for. Um, but again, that journalism major um, and my political science or polit politics and governments minor um, kind of makes me like a Swiss Army knife. Um, I'm a jack of all trades. Um, when it comes back to, and particularly, the liberal arts education that I received here at Ohio Wesleyan, because I may not know a lot about one specific subject, but I sure do know a lot about a lot of different things. Um, and in the environmental universe, that's everything from regulations. Um, I can spout off, you can ask me just about any program um, administered by US EPA, and I can talk to you about it. And I can talk to you intelligently about it. Um, I can counsel you when your company has a mass catastrophe and slams a barge into a marina um, and destroys everything in sight. Um, I can tell you what to say um, to the public and I can tell you what to say to the reporters when they show up. Because um, I used to think, I used to be one, I still think like one. Um, I know what they're going to ask um, and I know how to counsel you to say the right thing so you're not putting your foot in your mouth. Um, you know, these are all the, the, the valuable things that, um, that I've had to make out of not being an expert in any one area, but turning myself into that expert in the room, um, that expert at the table when I needed to be that expert at the table. Um, and that's been, you know, the, the glass ceiling. Um, I'm sure you guys at some point in your career you'll get there. You'll bounce around and you'll hit the glass ceiling. Um, and it wasn't really just until recently in the past couple, uh, couple of years um, when I finally, finally cracked through that glass ceiling and I now sit in a C-suite level position um, for my company, um, which is a big deal for me personally. Uh, and that was a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice. Um, and, and I'll be pretty blunt with it. I lost a marriage over it. Um, and, um, but I gained a new marriage and um, <laughs> with somebody who I actually work with every day now. Um, we actually work together. Um, and that's a dream. So um, I think turning some of those worst experiences into the best experiences um, has given me a well-rounded career in what I do. I got, I got two that immediately come to mind. One, the first was actually at the Gazette. Um, we, one of my jobs as a uh, reporter was uh, going through all the 
traffic tickets uh, in, the, uh, in the courthouse and writing down the name of the person, their address, and their violation. And you'd be going through, you know, some days it was 30, some days it was 60. And one day I didn't realize that there were, that the two sheets could be, there were two sheets stapled together and one day one of the sheets was reversed. And so I wrote down the name of a person who uh, it was a drug, drunk driving case. Um, put it in the, it happened to go in the Saturday paper, uh, the Gazette didn't have a Sunday paper, and on Monday I came in, and it turned out that in my ignorance, um, I had written down the name of the woman who was the head of Alcoholics Anonymous as a drunken driving person. Uh, it was, it sounds funny, but it was really, really horrible. Uh, this woman had spent a great deal of time recovering her reputation, building a reputation as a, uh, uh, you know, a strong voice uh, against drunk driving. And by the way, as we were discussing it uh, at dinner, uh, that was the era where Mothers Against Drunk Driving was really kind of beginning. Uh, there was a lot of alcohol being cheaply served all around. So it, it was... Um, I felt horrible. The paper was the paper did a front page correction, uh, and the paper was also tied up in legal issues for a couple of years. Um, the lesson, <laughs> obviously, was a those piles of paper are representative of real people, and um, b you better be careful with what you're writing down and recording as you know fact and double check them. So that was that has um, you know stuck with me as a uh, uh, valuable and painful memory. Um, the other experience was um, I, I, when I was in Pittsburgh working for the Pittsburgh Press um, in the early uh, '90s. Uh, Scripps Howard owned the paper, and um, I guess they were ahead of their time and decided that they were going to close down our paper way before everybody else started closing down papers. And, and I was uh, 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 second in, uh, number two editor uh, in the sports department there. Um, and uh, this went on for months, trying to figure out what was gonna happen. There was a strike that, that, uh, that precipitated the decision to close the paper, a strike by the Teamsters Union. And um, we didn't, they, the, the only non-union people were the reporters uh, in the, at the press, which was included me. So they kept us, they figured we were basically the only asset they had, so they kept us coming to work uh, every day to basically do nothing, which um, initially sounded great. <laughs> it, was, it was, the thinking was, this is the chance for us to do all those projects that we never have time to do. Um, and that lasted about two weeks, and then everybody was realized that this was not going to this was not going to end anytime soon. Um, and people, a lot of the people in the newsroom had, n had never worked anywhere else, never lived anywhere else. And by the end of this thing, people were literally getting physically ill uh, from the stress. Um, and um, it, uh, you know, just that whole experience as as colleagues on both sides of me here <laughs> have experienced as well, uh, you know, kind of um, just really, as we've experienced uh, cutbacks and buyouts and, and whatnot over the years here and there, you know, just kind of uh, helped me remember that, that my colleagues are people too and, you know, dealing with them on a human level uh, is as important as dealing with them on a professional level and caring about their their needs and, and them as people. Um, I think the couple things I wanted to mention are perhaps uh, less specific and a little more touchy-feely. The first obstacle uh, I felt in getting a career going is was uh, the, the need to be comfortable or get comfortable uh, getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, when you get a career going, um, it, it's just full of curveballs. I remember uh, 
thinking that well, my first newspaper job, boy, I have very little in common with these people and everyone's older than me. And there's just all sorts of things that are, you know, a big obstacle. I was from New York and when I got out of school, I wanted to go back to the East Coast. And six months and 200 resumes later, uh, being unemployed, out of money, uh, oh, and I also envisioned myself as being a famous foreign correspondent. Uh, and I got an offer to be the night police reporter at the Indianapolis Star. And it was basically covering uh, murders and fatal car accidents. And my hours were 6 p.m. to 2 in the morning. And I had Tuesdays and Wednesdays off. And I did that for about, for about two years. But when that offer came along, there was just no doubt that I had to take it because I, I had nothing else happening. And that was a very jarring uh, experience, um, but you had to do it. A uh, few years later, thinking, okay, now I've done that, now I really want to get back east. I got offered a job in a bureau in Detroit. Uh, this was in the Reagan recession. Uh, that wasn't really where I wanted to go either. Just as I was getting comfortable there, I was moved uh, across the country to Denver. I did like Denver, but I didn't know anybody there. Uh, so there were a lot of moves that just uh, were extremely uncomfortable. Uh, but that is part of getting a career going, is getting out of your comfort zone. And then the related thing I would mention is just uh, really getting to a point, particularly if this isn't necessarily your personality, of believing in yourself. Uh, when you start on a new job or a new, uh, you know, a new assignment, uh, there will be any number of people who are telling you you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and at some point, you just have to power through. Uh, having been in Washington now for 32 years, uh, I've realized that there are a lot of people in Washington whose, uh, whose success is primarily about uh, their ability to be self-promoters rather than their real ability to do good work uh, at what they're doing. And so you have to get out of your comfort zone, you have to believe in yourself, and at some point uh, after you start believing in yourself, you have to do some promoting of yourself as well because a lot of other people are doing a lot of promoting of themselves. Just, I just want to follow up because hearing you two and then also my own experience, I think I, one thing for those of you who are in college here, <laughs> which is most of you, um, I think that there can sometimes be this sense that you have to know what you're gonna do when you get out of college. And as all three of us are examples, um, that's not true. <laughs> you, can, you can find your way to a career by you know, going out and doing something that you, you know, you're obviously it's best if you're interested in, 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 in the job that you're uh, uh, taking, but it, it's likely not gonna be the last job that you hold and it can lead you down a path toward all kinds of other opportunities that you may not have even thought about before. And I think that's also something I tell people about Ohio Wesleyan that I thought was fantastic for me is that the liberal arts education exposes you to all kinds of different subjects and and gives you an opportunity to, you know, because you're required to, I guess, in some ways, take different courses. Um, you, you know, you kind of encounter some things maybe that you wouldn't have you wouldn't have encountered if you hadn't been forced to take that class. For sure. um, I would say the biggest obstacle, interestingly, sort of the opposite of here, was probably at the end of my career um, in magazine publishing. The first part of it, as, as I've mentioned, was actually quite, um, it, it, when it sort of moved itself along, I was very lucky in the way that it happened, and that was a time that, you know, jobs could be created for people, um, you know, on an editor's say-so. Um, and so I was lucky enough to kind of, you know, just move along. I worked for four editors um, over the, the course of my time. Um, and so that it worked, it worked out well. I think the biggest obstacle for me was probably um, realizing that it was ending, um, you know, accepting that it was changing, um, not in a good way, and that I was going to have to figure out something else to do. 
um, because I had always wanted to be a magazine editor and um, you know, as it was getting you know, more and more difficult as the market was changing um, and the business model was imploding, um, I, I, I think I just wanted to sort of you know, not acknowledge that that was happening. And I think that was a bunch of us you know, that had worked together for a long time. We just kind of kept saying, we'll figure this out somehow, but we're going to keep putting out this, you know, this great magazine that means, you know, that means something to, you know, to millions of women out there. So I think it was, it was very hard to admit that that was ending. Um, even as, as miserable as I was doing it for the last couple of years, that was hard to admit that it was ending and figure out the next thing. Um, and that was, it, that was not easy. It required a lot of um, mental heavy lifting that I think I'd been avoiding for uh, those couple of years. Um, so I would say, you know, the lesson there is just, you know, things do that, you know, they'll change, they'll end, whether you want them to or not. Sometimes it will surprise you, sometimes it, it won't, and you'll have seen it coming and just sort of not said so, but, um, you know, you keep going. You figure, you figure out something. There's always, if you have a solid education um, and you've maintained your network, um, which is, you know, always an important thing, um, you'll figure something out. You'll figure something out, I, that's what I would say. How has the media landscape changed over the course of your career? And what has been the most significant transformation? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me just say, I'll, Gordon can talk about the days when they were cutting stories uh, you know, into the caves and, and doing that sort of thing. But uh, <laughs> he started earlier than me. No. Um, as we were talking about at dinner, we, when, um, when we started, we were using typewriters, and as Paul was saying, that the, he took a class to uh, a, group of, a group of students to Chicago, and they didn't know what the typewriter was, <laughs> how to use it. Um, so, yeah, it's been unbelievable for me, uh, and I'm sure everyone else up here can, uh, can agree, because of what's happened in a relatively short time, um, I... Uh, uh, I was named sports editor at the New York Times in 2003, and in the interview process, the internet barely came up. And within 18 months, we were doing podcasts and we were making videos. And, um, you know, now, uh, just five years ago or so, the Times reorganized its entire newsroom, uh, less than five years ago, actually, reorganized its entire newsroom to um, uh, enable the reporters and editors there to more focus on digital presentations that are going to be more vi that are more visual that have videos embedded in them, um, you know, my early career was all on uh, all about print, obviously, and uh, you know, glad to be uh, involved in print as well. But in the middle there, I was involved in, in a lot of the digital stuff too, and it's just unbelievable the. Um, evolution of, of the digital report. Um, one, one oddity is that we're, at the times, the, the most sought after people now are engineers um, to uh, help build our, our technical and support our technical uh, uh, operations on the, uh, on the, primarily on the digital side. Um, but it's exciting. It's, off, it's opened up so many different ways to be a journalist. Uh, you know, we now have people who are specialists in audio. We have people who are specialists in video, storytelling, you know. And I joked about the cave thing because people have been telling stories since the beginning of time in some form or another. And even as the media landscape is so challenged right now and newspapers are, you know, you see these news deserts developing in areas where uh, there aren't newspapers or any other form of news delivery right now. Um, there are a lot of people experimenting and trying to come up with ways to, to tell stories and, um, and share news. Uh, and um, there's sort of, sometimes I think there's a sort of mythology about the sanctity of journalism, but really there, there, there was the, the, the standards of journalism that we think of now, um, at the turn of the 20th century, there was yellow journalism, in the 20th century, not the 21st, was yellow journalism and uh, publishers who were hyping all kinds of 
you know, false stories and, and, and exaggerated stories and that sort of thing. And that continued, you know, into the, into the 20s and 30s. So, uh, you know, while, while it's easy to worry that there's going to be all these different websites or, or, or videographers or whatever's going on with YouTube and Facebook and all that, um, I feel like somehow people are going to figure out a way to, to share the news and tell stories and continue to, to um, share that information. Maybe I'm an optimist. Yeah, just uh, you've heard me allude to some of this before, but as uh, just to add to what Tom said, um, our editing tools at the transcript, when Tom and I worked at the transcript, uh, were a scissors, a red pencil, and a glue stick. That's how you edited stories. Um, and as I indicated earlier, I worked for 26 years at... Um, uh, a weekly news magazine, uh, and for decades and decades and decades in this country, weekly news magazines were for many people across the nation the primary way uh, they got their news. Uh, and um, that has ended, and, and would echo the point made earlier here, that it was a very sad and panic-inducing process to watch this ending, to see the uh, advent of the internet and to realize that the idea of people getting their news once a week in a printed magazine uh, was was ending. I, I have a vivid uh, recollection of one of our uh, one of my bosses at US News coming in and saying that they were starting something called a website and I would need to have something called an email address and she I remember her saying to me that that this would give you uh, a chance to interact more with our readers. And I said to her, I don't want to interact more with our readers. Uh, and she said, well, you know, you better, you better get used to it because uh, this is what's coming. I think when I first started off in the newsroom, I filed my very first story from a payphone um, because I was out at the scene of the story and I had a pocket full of quarters. <laughs> and that was, again, pre-cell phone. Um, so I had to find the closest payphone. Hopefully you all have seen what a payphone looks like. But um, plugging quarters in, and they used to have the phone numbers on them. So, you know, I would occasionally have to have the call back to that payphone um, and then put more quarters in it to receive the call back. So that was my first story was filed from a payphone. Um, my computer in the newsroom, my computer was an ATEX. I don't know if you guys had ATEX. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was, that was my modern technology um, when I first started reporting. I was the first reporter in our newsroom to get a PC. Ooh. Um, and it was giant. It took up my entire desk. Um, but it also had solitaire on it, which uh, was a new <laughs> advent for me. I was like, oh, this is a fun game until they figured out that, you know, you could not play solitaire on your computer while you're being a reporter. Um, and then to today, I can give you from the PR perspective, um, which I find odd and kind of blows my mind. Back in June, I received a request from a reporter for comment through my Facebook Messenger, which I don't check on a regular basis. Um, I Facebook, but I, I don't religiously check Messenger. And um, Norfolk Southern had an accident, uh, train derailment in a wetlands area in Virginia. And it was a local beat reporter um, who reached out to my company, Hepico, because we were the response contractor on the scene, um, you know, pulling rail cars up off, you know, out of the bogs and um, cleaning up coal um, that had spilled into the wetlands. Um, and they wanted a comment from us. Well, I can't speak on behalf of Norfolk Southern. Um, so in Facebook Messenger, I composed a response back to this reporter um, and later got a few calls when the uh, article ran online um, from a couple of our guys in the field that said we'd failed to respond to repeated requests for comment. Um, and then I got a few phone calls from Norfolk Southern, you know, asking why. And it turned into a, a, a little bit of a, a, a mess, but basically went back to the editor of this paper and found out later that he'd actually commented on Twitter about our lack of response, which then I went in and took a screenshot, because two can play at that game, <laughs> took a screenshot of my response and the timestamp on Facebook Messenger, which I am grateful for that, um, and then went back and had a Twitter war. So um, 
uh, times have changed, I guess, you know, from filing stories uh, on a payphone and ATEX computer to in now the PR industry, um, responding via Facebook Messenger and providing comments um, for a newspaper article um, that appears on a website through Twitter. So I'll, I'll follow up on that. I think um, one thing that I would say that has changed the media landscape, and I'm sure everyone here would agree, is social media, um, which has, I mean, really was an enormous, enormous, enormous um, you know, impact on, uh, on the day-to-day. -day. I think it, it changed the role of the editor um, to some extent because people are, so like what, pe you know, you, people are sharing whatever, you know, what they're sharing on social, that kind of, that's a news channel for people. Um, and so I think that what's interesting about that is that, you know, sort of depending upon who you're interacting with on social media for whatever reasons, they're, they're in part curating your news experience. Um, and so I, I, and that, that's kind of a crazy thing to think of, and I think that also how the role of the editor changed is that so like on Facebook um, or on any, in, on social and on the regular websites, all of those metrics um, are tracked in, on a constant basis. We were talking about that at dinner. Um, you know, I mean, minute by minute, you can see what stories are rising, what stories are falling. Um, you will have somebody above you asking why X story is falling and what ideas you have to make it you know, resurface. Um, so I think that those metrics, the existence of those metrics, which are measuring what people, you know, what, what the public is, is reading or, or thinking or commenting on, I think really changed the role of the editor, um, you know, because you're not only relying on your journalistic expertise, you're also having to, you know, you're having to justify what you say and do based on these metrics as well. I mean, if you want to keep succeeding, you know, at, at it. You have to keep those, you, those metrics became, I think, certainly over the past five years maybe or so, those metrics became so much more of a driver in what we could do, you know, on the, on the, on the, on the production side, you know, and, and it took away a lot of uh, editorial judgment, I think, to some extent, because you would maybe think of, you know, something that you wanted to do, some type of story, and if it didn't have another story that had been done just like that, that got great numbers, it would be like, oh, you know, I don't, we don't really, the last time we tried that, it didn't go anywhere. It didn't do anything for us. So I think it changed, how that changed the cycle is that you end up doing a lot of similar stories because you are responding to your stories that you've already done that did well, that got traction, that got likes, that got shared on Twitter, you know, that got reposted to Instagram, you know, sort of all of it. So you end up doing a lot of recycling because you are chasing that, you know, that, that traction again, but the thing is it's already changed by the time you, you know, you produce it a second time. They're not interested, they're on to the next thing. So that creates a dangerous cycle of, of recycling um, that I don't think serves anybody very well. So that's what I'll say about that. What media do you all consume and why? And how would you recommend students go about their media consumption? Well, I think it's important to look at a variety of media uh, who are serious about attempting to do objective journalism. There is lots of cross-current these days about this kind of bias or that kind of bias. Uh, but I think you have to ask yourself who has the resources and the tradition um, to do a fairly honest job on their news pages. Um, I am a dinosaur and every morning on my driveway there is the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and I think if you look at your various feeds involving serious news and scratch the surface, you will find that many stories that other outlets are claiming really began with serious outlets like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, or the Associated Press. The other admonition I'd make uh, has to do with seeking out a variety of opinions, uh, including ones that may not necessarily be yours. I think the internet has been a wonderful thing in 
uh, dramatically expanding uh, the voices who have a megaphone and the amounts of information. Uh, but I think there's been a downside as well in that um, I noticed that uh, many people, uh, when you know, I ask them what they're reading, uh, they seem to be reading only the outlets that they are, only the outlets in which they're confident those outlets will agree with the preconceived notions they already hold. And I think this is one reason for the polarization of our society is, you know, on the right, people are reading this or, you know, watching Fox News and saying, see, I was right all the time. And on the left, people are watching Rachel Maddow or uh, reading the New York Times editorial page and saying, see, I was right all the time. Um, people will often, uh, you know, when they know I'm a journalist, uh, will say things like, well, why don't you people ever tell the truth? And I'll say, well, okay, you know, what are you, what are you reading? And I'll get a series of ideological publications and I'll think, well, you know, if you're, if you're seeking the truth, then you have a responsibility to read outlets that you know won't always agree with you. I mean, that is part of, of truth seeking. I mean, I am a raging moderate. Uh, I don't agree with much of what's in the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, but I read it every day. They have a lot of smart people there, and there's a lot of really persuasive arguments there. So I think you have to think about the agendas of some of the sources that you're looking at, decide which sources you think are really have substance, and don't only read what you know is going to agree with the opinions you already hold. Um, being a journalist has and was um, always in my soul. Um, and I, too, um, am a lover of the hard copy of a newspaper. Um, I travel for my job quite a bit now, um, so I particularly like to pick up whatever local paper um, is available. I'm a big fan of the tiny paper that shows up on my little plastic bag on my gate every week. Um, I still read that. Um, I just came back from Mexico two weeks ago. Um, I was in Cabo and um, the local American paper down there, I don't speak Spanish, um, but the local American paper is called the Gringo Gazette. And I, <laughs> I read it cover to cover um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Um, and I, I, it drives my husband crazy, um, but my habit every morning um, when the alarm goes off um, and after I go downstairs and take the dogs out and feed the dogs, I come back upstairs and crawl under the covers um, and I spend 30 minutes on my phone and I go through every news channel you can think of. Um, I scroll through and I read headlines because um, I feel like I'm not equipped to start my day unless I know um, what the headlines are this morning and can speak intelligently um, to about what's going on in the world because no matter what your religion or your political persuasion is or what you personally feel um, about the environment or, or your universe, um, I still think everybody has a responsibility to be informed and be well informed um, and you have to take the time to do that and for me it's that 30 minutes at 6 o'clock in the morning um, when I scroll through the headlines. Um, and that's how I start my day every day. I agree with everything both of, both of those folks said, especially about the New York Times, Gordon, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, uh, so for, for, for the other thing that I, I will add to that as uh, what I use personally is Twitter uh, in, a, in a way that I've identified writers from different uh, publications who I admire and, and respect and uh, we'll you know, see what they've put on Twitter uh, in the past, uh, you know, however many hours since I last looked. Um, but the, the, other, uh, the other twist to this, I guess, is if you're interested in journalism, I'd also encourage you to look at um, sites that are innovative in the way they present news, and that doesn't necessarily mean uh, 
mainstream media, like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, although a lot of great stuff is being done there too. But, you know, there are sites like ESPN uh, has some pretty cool stuff they do sometimes. Um, uh, there's a whole variety of different, uh, of different sort of experimental sorts of things that are going on with news presentation. And, um, you know, if you're interested in that as a career, uh, I think it's great to, you know, kind of look at those things and, and just sort of see what can be done and come up with your own spin on it or your own sort of twist to it. It's also great to help you understand what career opportunities are out there now because it's real-time sort of examples of the kind of uh, different forms of journalism that are, that are being uh, expressed. I would say I agree with everything that they said. Um, I will follow up just sort of, I, I talked a little bit about the social media thing, just, um, you know, don't let your social media feed become your news feed. Um, you know, find your own news out there, find out, figure out what you're interested in, what you want to know more about, and then do your research. Um, it is important. It is, in a way, it's easier, you know, because of the internet, but it's also harder because of the internet, so you need to be a really good evaluator of sources. So. Um, I would say always wonder to yourself, why is this, you know, why, why would this person be saying this? Why would they be presenting it this way? Um, you know, ask those questions so that you are making sure to kind of give yourself the best opportunity to, to learn, because um, really that's what it ultimately, what you want it to be about is just, is the learning, so. The last question I have for you all this evening is what advice would you give current students who are trying to find jobs in journalism or communication? Um, that can be what kind of range of skills they should develop, what they should major in. Well, I, I'll, I'll go first. I, I, I touched on this before, but I think um, being open to all and, and being aware of all the different kind of skills that um, that are now being used to deliver journalism. So it's not just writing. I mean, I think you do, do you, whether you're doing video or audio or whatever, you have to be a good writer to, you know, prepare scripts and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, if you have a passion for photography or, or, or video or something like that, the opportunity is there to uh, pursue a career in journalism in many different ways than it's not just, you know, when Gordon and I were coming out of school, it was just uh, uh, TV, basically, that you could do that kind of thing. Now, it's kind of fascinating to me that CNN and MS and NBC and all the networks have online, you know, dot coms, and, and they're having stories written for the, their websites, and publications like the Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal are doing video presentations, so it's, it's almost like everybody's meeting in the middle to some extent. Um, so, I, you know, I think just Again, being aware and, 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 and looking at all the opportunities that are out there and, and sort of figuring out what your own skills are. The most, the, the, the likeliest starting spot is gonna be something where you're using all of your skills. You're, you're not likely to start as a specialist unless you're really gifted. Um, but, um, you know, finding a way to work your way in is, is the, best, the best way to do it, I think. As you've heard all of us basically did. I would uh, just add to what Tom said that one of the subtexts of wanting to have this panel, I think, was the the troubling question of, well, is is journalism going to make it? Uh, we we hear so much about how journalism is crippled, newspapers are going out of business, and 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 all that is is true. I would say one way to think about that is not to shy away from it, but I would say that the basic skills that are important in journalism translate very, very well to a number of other fields. Uh, being able to write cogently uh, and gracefully um, is a skill that is important in almost any profession, and I can't tell you how many times I hear from my friends, contemporaries in other businesses, um, law, for instance, that, oh my God, I can't believe it. This, this guy is, he's smart, but he can't write an English sentence. He's never gonna succeed. You're gonna have to be able to be a good writer to advance in almost any career you've got. And being thoughtful and aggressive 
and innovative in how to research or in journalistic terms how to report uh, will also be important in any field you go into. Uh, beyond that, I'd say given the issues that journalism and media are having today and given the ways media has changed, which we've talked about at some length, what that means is that the number and breadth of skills that folks will be looking for in hiring people at media companies is broad. So I would say try to pursue as many of them as you can. Uh, if you're looking to be hired by a small uh, media outlet, uh, you know, they're gonna wanna know, well, can you take pictures? Uh, if you're a good photographer, what a bonus. Uh, can you handle audio? Uh, can you do video presentation? Can you do web design? Uh, are you facile in social media? Um, do you know how to code? Uh, the, the numbers of skills that are involved in getting into the media world today and advancing in the media world are just uh, greater in number, broader and deeper than they ever have been before. I would say that I agree with both gentlemen um, and I would say I would add I think um, get familiar you know develop a basic familiarization with metrics um, because they drive a lot of what goes on with media um, and so and I, so I mean I see it someone questioning wondering what that means uh, measurement um, metrics that tell you like how something is trending on your website if people are you know are sharing it if they're liking it if they're interacting with it um, there's lots of different metrics in that regard, it's like a like is one thing, but then if somebody comments, that's better than a like because now that brings it to a level of what's called interacting or engaging. Um, and so a lot of those metrics drive, you know, they, they drive what goes on, um, they matter. It, you know, even if we, as journalists, like, don't want them to matter because we, you know, we wanna, we sort of wanna be, I think, I don't, I don't wanna say above that, but like, you know, we, we wanna not feel like they're you know, like they're, like they're sort of driving the bus, but metrics really matter, so um, learn about them. I didn't learn about them, um, and I, I probably should have. Um, it, it turned out not to matter because I do something, you know, different now, but I think I would say metrics matter and social media mat uh, matters. You know, somebody who can play on, you know, in those, in those playgrounds, especially on, tw uh, especially on Twitter, um, and certainly also on Facebook, since that's still a sort of behemoth, um, I think that has value too. In or, you know, somebody who has that that capability, that sense of what is maybe not so much the most um, maybe not, not the most newsworthy thing, but something that's going to get engagement. Um, media companies want that. They want that engagement, and they want to be able to see evidence of it. And that's what metrics is. So learn about it. I think the single biggest piece of advice that I can give you is to always care about and protect your reputation, your personal reputation. Um, it is your calling card that will follow you throughout your career. So if you act with integrity, um, every time you're representing yourself, every time you're representing the company for whom you work, um, and that means everything. It means get it right. Um, it was the mantra that I followed when I was here at Ohio Wesleyan when I was learning to become a reporter. Um, Paul pushed all of us um, to dig deeper and get it right. You know when a piece of the story is missing. You know when you haven't talked to everybody that you could potentially talk to. So dig deeper. Um, don't allow yourself to settle in your core um, for not going all the way and, and, and pursuing it to the wit's end that you could pursue it. Um, because that reputation is what's gonna allow you to grow um, and be recognized by others, um, to elevate in positions, um, to earn the respect of your colleagues and peers in the industry. Um, so your reputation truly is um, your calling card and it's what carries you uh, through your career. So you know, be mindful that everything you do um, everything you say, all your actions, your intentions, um, it's a reflection back on who you are. Um, so, you know, make integrity at your core um, and, and your reputation 
um, will what, what earn you um, the next rank in what you're pursuing in your career. We're going to have time for a couple of questions for the audience. I do just want to give the panelists a chance to add anything that's come up over the course of the conversation that, that you've thought of that you wished you had said or something that you really wanted to say that hasn't really squeezed into the framework of the questions we gave you. Can we take back some things? That we <laughs> Absolutely. It's called a retraction. <laughs> well, I will just follow up on Kara's point and um, be aware of what you're doing on social media now. <laughs> um, we've had uh, a few incidents where uh, editors and reporters, uh, and, and this has happened not just with us, but with athletes uh, who uh, did something when they were 14 years old on Twitter or some other social media platform. And lo and behold, at age 30, somebody has looked up what they did 16 years ago and it's not pretty. It's a, you know, at a minimum, it's horribly embarrassing. And uh, so I, I, I think she's got a great point about your reputation and that is reflected very much in your social media, um, what you do on social media. I would agree with that for sure. Um, and I would also echo just about the importance of remembering um, that it's, it's really key to make sure that what you put out there um, is right to the absolute best of your ability because um, I think with a lot of the, the younger um, you know, writers and editors that I hired in my last probably five years at the magazine, um, it was very, I felt like as a manager and as a mentor, it was hard to get across to them the importance of making sure that things were right because if it was wrong, it's, you, know, you just go in on the back end and you fix it. And it's like, yes, there is that. It, it's not the same as printing it on a piece of paper that's going to live forever and is going out um, you know, into the world and in libraries and, you know, will sort of exist. The come and go nature of the internet, I think, has changed that. And so if you can, I feel like the people, the younger reporters felt like, mm, if something slipped by and it wasn't correct, you just go in on the back end and you change it. And it's kind of like the whole thing never happened. And in fact, it did happen. And you're changing it for the people who read it from when you fixed it forward, but what about all the people that saw it before you fixed it? And maybe that was two people, maybe it was 2,000, maybe it was whomever, but um, it really would have been better to get it right the first time and not rely on the capability to go in on the back end and just make changes. As an adjunct, it was the policy uh, at the Center for Public Integrity to never allow a story to be changed on the web without saying at the top of that story, this story has been corrected and explaining what wrong it had said before and what was changed. Tom, what's the, what's the Times policy on that? Yeah, it's, it's the same, yeah. Um, uh, I, I frankly don't, we, we, we put a correction with it and I think we, certainly if there's a correction, we, basically it's the same, yeah. And so you flag the corrections? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can't just sneak in and say, oh, we're just going to change that. No one will notice. Right. <laughs> you hope. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for the service that you guys have done over your careers. I know that growing up, having a mother that didn't really speak English that well, um, there was a big burden on me to learn the language right and learned it correctly. And it's awesome that people like you guys dedicated a lot of that um, blood and sweat to delivering stories because it's very, very important. So thank you very much. Um, my question has to do with something that one of you guys said, I don't remember who, but one of you guys said that you guys carry um, the pressure of making sure that the facts are right. So how does it feel to have that power of creating facts? <laughs> Well, we're not creating we're facts. Not creating them, <laughs> we're reporting them, actually, but um, there is a lot of creative news. <laughs> so there, it's, it's an interesting distinction. Um, yeah. 
I mean, look, it's the, but in, in all seriousness, they're, they're um, one of President Trump's uh, top people, you know, disputes, you know, a couple of times they've said something about fact, you know, alternative facts, I guess it was, right? Um, yeah, I mean, now uh, there's a lot of pressure on getting the facts straight because we have a president of the United States who doesn't acknowledge facts, right? So um, that makes things uh, very, uh, very difficult and challenging um, in the in the business, um, and also as we frequently discuss, you make one mistake and it's magnified way more than it ever was before. So there's enormous pressure on getting the facts straight. I think the time factor um, has really influenced yeah. the thinking. You know, there's an enormous pressure. Um, to be first because of the internet, you know, before, whereas when news was being printed on paper, you had a little bit more time to make sure that your facts were verified and that they were really bedrock. And nowadays with the internet, when you can push content up, you know, almost instantaneously, um, I think it's, you're, you're, you end up kind of weighing, I don't think at the New York Times, for instance, but you know, like in other, in other, uh, you know, outlets, it, refuse the term broadly, um, I think you get into a situation of, of way, having to weigh whether you want to be right or whether you want to be first, um, and that that changes the game. So, well, and, and I'll just say that there is, I mean, there there have been moments where people have said, "No, we got to be right, even if we're not first. And uh, the our, the Sandy Hook uh, shooting was was really one of the most eye-opening uh, lessons in that. I think in that uh, there were, obviously it was a horrible thing, um, but as is also the case with any kind of tragedy like that or any kind of horrible incident like that, there's all kinds of incorrect information, even coming from good sources like the police, who, you know, a police officer might tell a reporter something he or she had heard from another police officer and be doing it uh, in goodwill, not, not deliberately saying something wrong, but if that information came to the police officer wrong, then all of a sudden it's being reported incorrectly by the media. And there were a number of things that were uh, reported incorrectly in that incident, including the brother of, of the uh, shooter being publicly named uh, as the shooter for a number of hours before it became clear that, that, the, that there was another brother and that he had been, actually been the one who had done the shooting. So yeah, it's a, it, it, that's an excellent point about the time. One of the things that, um, you know, particularly in the current political atmosphere we're in, one of the things uh, that is a function of the internet that has actually helped a little bit is that people don't just have to believe us if we say something like this congressional committee concluded thus and so in a report last week. We can actually link to the report so people can look at it themselves. And we have, and many publications have had to do that as much as possible, that whenever you are citing a source that is a documentary source and the, the source is available on the web that when you're talking about it, you link to that source so people can look for themselves and verify that what you're telling them is correct. That's a great point. Yeah, I think um, just very briefly, the point that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, my mantra that started here at Ohio Wesleyan is get it right. Um, and I think as a, as a journalist, it really rang true for me and I'm glad that you mentioned Sandy Hook, um, was the first murder um, that I covered as a reporter. And, um, you know, there was a lot of initial rush to judgment. Um, you know, it was a gas station attendant who, um, late night clerk shift, and was gunned down by a teenager who was pulling a robbery. Um, and there was a lot of rush to judgment. Um, media swarmed everywhere, and people were just getting information from basically anybody who was standing around on the scene. Um, and for me, um, it really hit home um, when the family of the clerk arrived at the scene. And, and I'd, it was right down the street from my house, so I had 
the ability to, to go and was kind of there at the beginning. I'll never forget the gentleman's name. I'll never forget his face. Um, I'll never forget seeing through the window the crime scene before they covered him up with the sheet. Um, and knowing that his family arrived right behind me um, just kind of burned into my brain, um, really for those types of stories, any type of story, um, but particularly for those types of stories, um, that that means something to somebody. There's, there's a human side to reporting the news. There's a human side to reporting the facts. Um, and that whole mantra of get it right really rang true for me on the, on the first um, murder that I covered as a reporter. Hi. Um, whoa, that's really loud. Uh, I also wanted to thank you so much for being here. This has been really helpful for me. I have a question for you specifically, but like if you guys have any experience with what I'm about to ask, please feel free to chip in. So um, I want to go into environmental education. I'm a double zoology and communication major. Um, and I was just wondering if you had any advice to me about like how to get involved in that area. Um, because I'm really struggling, like I love both of those, but it's just, it's really hard to like balance about what I should be doing and whatnot. Um, also, do you think that a science degree would have been beneficial in your particular area of expertise? <laughs> um, you know, of course, having the benefit of hindsight being 2020, I should have done much better in geology. <laughs> Um, much better. Um, at least now I can identify some more rocks than I was able to um, when I was here during my tenure at OWU. Um, I think, no, there are days that I say, gosh, I wish I was a scientist or I wish I was an, had been an engineer. Um, but I wouldn't trade it for the experience and what I learned and what I can bring to the table now. Um, but that said, I, and, and you all, we all are, you all will be um, continuing learners. Um, you will continue to educate yourself lifelong. Um, you'll have a lifelong career in learning, um, depending on which direction you go in your career. Um, and I think times are interesting now in the environmental industry, particularly when it comes to communications, because there's a lot of corporate entities that are becoming more conscious about the footprint that they're leaving. Um, and you know the environmental damage that they do, um, or their corporate social responsibilities. Um, so, uh, 20 years ago, when I got into this field, that was, was hardly anybody did environmental communications. Um, there was a small group within PRSA, the Public Relations Society of America. Um, we had a small environmental committee. I think there were about 30 of us, truly, um, within a society of 27,000 that did environmental communications. Um, now there's obviously way more than that. Um, you'll have everything from utility industries to marine shipping. Um, you know, BP obviously brought a lot of uh, corporate social responsibility on the environmental front to the forefront. Um, and I'd be happy to speak with you uh, and give you my card afterwards so I can give you some leads and other prospects. But I think you'll find um, at least environmental communications to be a promising field if that's something you want to pursue. I would just add also that um, having a specialized subject expertise um, in the long run is always likely to stand you in good stead in, in, in journalism. Um, your environmental uh, passion, if you go into journalism, you may not be able to use that in your first job or two. But down the road, when someone's looking for an environmental reporter, that is going to pop off your resume and you will bring a lot more to the table. And I think that's actually more important today than it's ever been because one of the things that's happening with media is that the general interest publications are dying, but the niche publications are the ones that are having success. Um, and and you'll find more and more publications, more and more little, little newsletters whose subject may be, you know, like this, but there is an audience for that particular uh, subject. And I think the environment uh, is one area where you see this, publications like High Country News, Inside Climate News, and so forth. These publications uh, have an audience and they're doing well or in Washington, we have Politico, this political newspaper, and it's a great general interest newspaper, but where they're really making their money is on what we call niche verticals, of which they have about 20 now. 
Politico environment, Politico trade, Politico foreign policy, Politico defense contracting, and these are areas where people will be looking not only for journalism competence, but subject expertise. Um, like a lot of baby boomers, I grew up with the news from Walter Cronkite, CBS Evening News, and from the newspapers that delivered in the morning, New York Times. For me, it was the Hartford Current and the uh, Waterbury Republican, Connecticut. And so one grows up with those habits, and now I get my news from online New York Times, online Wall Street Journal, online Washington Post. To a certain extent, I grew up with Time Magazine. I don't trust um, online-only news sources in general. I have a prejudice. I know that that's an irrational prejudice, but if there's no print analog to what I'm reading, I don't trust it as much. Can you disabuse me of that prejudice? <laughs> can, you, can you disabuse me of that prejudice? Am I just a cranky old baby boomer? I mean, I just, I don't trust Huffington Post. I don't trust uh, Daily Beast. They don't have paper analogs. Yeah, that's great, great news for me. I mean, Thank you. No, no. I, I mean, uh, yeah, no. Um, well, I, no, I actually think that there are uh, very reputable digital only uh, uh, operations. Uh, you know, it's, it's much cheaper and easier to launch a digital operation and to, uh, uh, you know, you can basically do it with handful of people um, but you know use use your judgment too um, uh, there are I think as I said many reputable digital I mean Politico actually is is a good example of that I think uh, Politico actually is now doing some print version of, of some of their stuff um, uh, but but you know uh, again you, you have to use your judgment and I, I wouldn't as Gordon had said earlier, I wouldn't rely just on one source uh, in, in this day and age. You know, the more, the more you can learn about a different subject from different sources, the better you are. But, but you've, um, uh, it wasn't your point, but you've alluded to something that I think is, is really the greatest tragedy in journalism today. Uh, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Washington Post uh, still are doing great work. That there are still great national publications. Where we're really suffering is with the complete hollowing out of terrific regional newspapers like the Hartford Current or the Waterbury Republican, which I also grew up on, or uh, the Denver Post, which had become a great paper when it was being edited by our colleague Greg Moore, who was class of 76 and is now owned by a private equity firm that has hollowed it out to like two interns and a dog. I mean, this is the, this is the only big newspaper in a 12-state region. Uh, and I would, I would argue even that until, you know, fairly recently, uh, when it was still owned by the Wolves, the Columbus Dispatch was a fairly serious regional newspaper that you might not agree with every day, but it took its regional responsibilities seriously, and now it is owned by private equity. So this is where, this is where I feel the real tragedy is. And there are some who are trying to fill that void with philanthropy or coming up with alternative websites, and that is, uh, a glimmer of hope, but it's this is what I think is pretty bleak at the moment. I, I would agree with that for sure, and I think what we talked about a little bit at dinner. One effect of that is that, so you know, the lacking, the, you know, the, the lack of the local papers. I would think um, it, it ultimately is going to have a is going to create a difficulty with young reporters cutting their teeth because they're are not young, young reporters covering City Hall. There are not young reporters covering local education. There are not young reporters you know, covering all the things that young reporters typically started out covering because those local newspapers that would have employed them no longer exist. And so it's not so much that those, I mean, that, that those jobs don't exist is, they've been sort of replaced by other jobs. It's not that, but it's the idea of cutting your teeth doing that very, very important work. 
um, and it's sort of not being done anymore under the new under the new model as much. And and so down the road, it'll make it you know, there'll be fewer of those reporters around, um, and that's that's sad. I mean that just stinks. <laughs> I'll give you the um, environmental and industrial we touched on this, a few of us touched on this during conversation at dinner. Um, printing presses are beginning to go by the wayside and those industrial facilities that support mass printing and mass publication um, as you know, the entities and this companies are gobbling each other up, um, they're closing their facilities and consolidating, um, leaving behind you know, the environmental issues that come with owning print shops. Um, you're talking about the ink, you're talking about the machinery, it's an industrial facility. Um, it requires, you know, servicing from companies like mine. Um, we go in and, you know, suck out, you know, vac out pumps and, you know, pits and um, we deal with ink spills and, you know, we deal with the paper and, and, and other issues um, that come and that adds to the expense of printing. Um, so, you know, when you've got people behind the scenes, um, you know, that are private equity companies that are stroking checks, and you've got the ability to put your publication out online versus put it out in print. Um, you know, there's the argument for being more environmentally friendly and taking your publication online. That doesn't make the content um, any less reliable. Um, it's just the, the, the environmental factors of where we're going as a world right now. Um, and those days of, you know, industrial production to produce those things, I think eventually will go by the wayside. Which raises a question that I suspect hopefully more than just me have been wondering ever since I found out what you're doing now, Tom. Have you gotten to say stop the presses? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> but I have to say it's not nearly as dramatic or as exciting as you'd like it to be. In fact, the first time I heard someone do it was the night that uh, Jacqueline Onassis uh, died. And uh, the, the person in charge of the, uh, of the then composing room picked up the phone and said, uh, we've got to stop the presses. It's like, that's it? That's all you're going to do? Like, no, no bells or whistles? But that's it. You're calling one person on another, you know, at the plant and telling them, we've got to stop the presses. we got a big story. I hate to put a stop to this. <laughs> but... Um, it is rapidly approaching closing time. So I want to ask everyone to please thank our panelists and Erin for her bravery. Um, and yes, just thank you so much for sharing all of this.